With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Ah, welcome back to Heard Tell. Okay, when we want to talk culture and pop culture and movies, this is our guy. He is the maven of the Mendez movie report. See what I did there? You like that? You might want to copyright that. Movie <laughs> Mendez, Louis Mendez, our buddy down in Tampa, breathing a sigh of relief because they kind of missed the big one, although their neighbors to the south are hurting, but they got through the hurricane all right. Glad to see you, buddy, even more than usual. Hey, I'm glad to be here. Glad to not uh to actually have power to actually be, be at my house and it's not flooded. So uh, thank God for all that because uh, Fort Myers got it real rough. In fact, uh, actually, my in-laws actually know someone who lost their house, just completely flooded and they just, they're just going to quit on it. They're not going to even bother to try to get the house back. Yeah, it's sad stuff. Fort, um, for those of you from Logan, um, we, they thought this hurricane was going to come in right on Tampa Bay. It swung south at the last second, hit Fort Myers head on, uh, really obliterated those poor folks down there. He's in the Tampa area, but he's our movie guy, so let's talk a little movies. All right, summer blockbuster season's kind of over now. We're in the fall season. We're in award season. Let's review for a second because this was supposed to be the summer that movies were back, baby. Uh, no COVID, very few restrictions. Everybody's going to come back. I'm looking at the numbers. You know, we're we're data guys. You're a data guy. Our movie's back because when I look at this list, I see Marvel, I see Jurassic Park, and then I see basically Top Gun, and then there's a whole bunch of everything else. Is that a healthy movie season? Is that the big we're back movie season people were expecting? I mean, honestly, I, I'm pretty cynical about this at this point when it comes to the box office. It's it's pretty obvious that if it's not a major IP uh, that is knowable for folks, even something like Top Gun, which was a it, it, people expected it to be a success. I'm not sure they expected it to be this successful, but even something like that, at least it's a known IP with a known name, with a known star. If you don't have that, it's going to be really hard for you to make like really big noise at the box office. If anyone's made any noise at the box office this year in terms of original stuff, it's been horror. And even horror, you know, you're, you're talking about it's a different measure. You're not going to be making a unless you have like something ridiculous like The Exorcist or it or the first it movie. You're not your your measure of success is going to be a little bit different than the big, big blockbusters. But unless you're doing original horror this year, if you're not doing IP, you're going to suffer unless you also have something like Every Day, Everywhere, All at Once, which was able to be this big hit with getting legs. Um, incredible success for an indie movie, but even that only made only made over a hundred million dollars, which is like chump change of Marvel. Um, so it, I, I, I think people are coming back to the theaters. The thing is, is that people are selective about what they come back to the theaters too, especially after the pandemic era conditioned them to be more and more comfortable with streaming. Yeah, I think you got a good point. I got a bit of a theory on Top Gun, and I love it. This is one of the rare movies I ever went and saw it twice. One of the reasons for that is because the first time I saw it, I saw it in IMAX, and I wanted to see it in a regular screen because when you're seeing IMAX, you miss stuff. Like, you just can't. There's too much going on. So I actually went to this movie twice, and you know me. I don't like movie theaters, so that tells you something. But my fandom of that franchise aside, I've got a bit of a theory on Top Gun. I think I don't think people did this on purpose. I don't think they got on a message board or social media and discussed this. I do think Top Gun was a little bit of a protest thing for some folks going to the movies of like, yeah, this is the kind of movie we will go out to the movies and see. I I think that it's not a huge thing, but I think it's a something because a lot of people I talked to is like, yeah, that's the only movie I went to this year. I I think there's a little something to that. Yeah, because first of all, it's it's a movie that's just it, it's entertaining. It's not trying to do any particular message. And while I don't mind a movie that tries to have a message or tries to hit on certain themes, those kinds of movies can end up being inaccessible if the, if it's not done right. They can be very one note. Whereas this is more of a pure 
crowd pleaser. Plus, it's not a superhero movie. You know, it's it's something different than what people have been used to. Um, it's not just a bunch of CGI green screen stuff going on. Yes, there's visual effects in Top Gun, but a lot of it is practical effects. And I think that the industry is responding every bit the way that the audiences have responded because uh, there was we had the Telluride Film Festival, which is the out of all the major festivals, that's the one where a lot of Academy voters like to go to. And I was listening to a podcast to uh, one of the folks who actually talks to these voters. And what really struck him is how many of them said that they love Top Gun Maverick. And then there was an interview with Quinn and freaking Tarantino, one of all people who said that it's his favorite movie of the year so far. And that really goes to show you how big of a hit it's been. I think because it does, it is able to stand out. It's not an art house movie. It's a big blockbuster. Every It's accessible to everybody. And it's not the same old blockbuster that people have seen over and over again the last couple of years. Yeah, to your point, talking to Luis Mendez, our movie maven, uh, I'm looking at the domestic box office numbers for 2022. You get down to number nine before you get an original thing that is not a franchise or a sequel. And that's the Elvis movie, which is not exactly fr right. non-franchise and not sequel, although it was a unique take. By the way, I actually like the movie. I know it was pretty, but yeah, I, I gave it a good review too. But I bring up Elvis because you know what Elvis really was? It was a superhero movie. <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, with the way it was shot and, and some of the things that they were able it's to a do. Marvel but, yeah. It was a. I was sitting there watching it, and I and I like that. You know, I I really enjoyed it. I was able to, you know, you, you've heard me do this. I'm a Philistine. I'm not the fancy critic you are. Somewhere in that two hours, I got to forget I'm watching a movie for at least 30 seconds. You know what I'm saying? That's yeah. just kind of my standard of a movie. Like, can I just forget it and get into it for at least a moment? I got into that. I, I thought it was clever, you know, but I was also sitting there with my kids. I'm like, this is a Marvel movie. This is laid out like a Marvel movie. It has the Marvel movie beats. It has the dark spots. It has the sarcastic humor. It has the weird cut shot action scenes. That's a Marvel movie. Am I wrong? I mean, no, you're not wrong. But it's also what you might come to expect from Lerman because he's known to he when it comes to Boz, it's almost like he wants to make his movies feel almost like you're at a party at the same time. Uh, and and I think that's why he was able to do such a unique take compared to a lot of the standard biopics. I also think it's why it ended up being pretty successful. Supposedly had a ridiculous uh, standing ovation that lasted a long time at cons. Um, I think it's got an outside shot to get into the picture race. I don't quite have it in there just yet. But Austin Butler, who played Elvis, is definitely getting a lot of uh, praise for his performance. Uh, people are a little more divisive about Tom Hanks in the fat suit. But um, yeah, I mean, I personally thought it was a that movie was incredibly fun, uh, very different than your standard biopic. Uh, I mean, it, if, if anybody out there has HBO Max, you can watch it right now. It's on HBO Max right now. Yeah, we actually purchased it because we liked it enough and the kids have been re-watching it. But to, and by and Austin Butler, even people that didn't like the movie because they didn't like you know the way Baz does stuff, everybody's just like it's an incredible performance. It really is. He he was really good yeah. in it. But back to the larger point, okay, that's nine of the top ten movies that are not original material. Number 10's Uncharted. That was a video game. You get down to eleven, you get the nope, which by the way is a horror genre. You yeah, know? now that that is original, but very original too original should, by some people's measures. But I would point <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, but I would point out that that is also directed by Jordan Peele, who almost has his own brand name as well. this and by the way just to finish out the top 15 here light light year which was very devices from disney but that's another franchise the lost city which was original and if you're too young to remember what romancing the stone was because it was the same movie except yeah. with f words and and but uh bullet train which was a remake of a uh 
movie from overseas. And then you get down to 15 before you get to the bad guys. I'm just looking at this list, man. Which, by the way, the bad guys is an adaptation of a book. It doesn't get any better from there. 16, Fantastic Beasts. That's Harry Potter. 17 is DC Super Pets. And then 18 is where the Crawdads sings, which is a book adaption. That's traditionally where you get a big movie. You get it from a book adaption. You got to go all the way down to 18. And the money gap from 18 to Top Gun at one is the GDP of most European nations. It's ridiculous. Yes, yes, yeah. I'm, when people on, you know, I know Twitter ain't real life and Facebook ain't reality. When people are saying there's nothing original at the movies and that's why I don't go to the movies, there's validity to the accusation. And it seems to be getting worse, not better. I mean, there's validity in terms of what the big studios are giving money to. Now, if you actually go to every weekend and try to check out some of the smaller movies, there's definitely a lot of original stuff out there. Of course, the problem is a lot of folks don't go out to see the movie. Now, sometimes it's because of marketing. Maybe they don't even know that movie exists. That's another big thing. Um, but also, I, I honestly think a lot of people have just been very conditioned to say, I'm not going to take the risk, especially with the way ticket prices are, we, with the, the situation we got with inflation doesn't help either, where they say, I'm going to be very careful as to what I'm going to spend my money to go to the theater, where I'm going to have to buy money for the concessions. I might have, to, I might, might or might not have to deal with some rude uh, person in the theater who's making the experience uh, difficult. And what's safe what's safe are the known properties that they know but when they see all this other original stuff maybe we'll say well i know this can show up on netflix i know this can show up on hbo max uh, i know it's going to be on vod in a couple of weeks especially with the theatrical window getting shorter and shorter and shorter um and i'm just going to catch it at home because it's much more comfortable that way um, and i think that's why you see some of these legacy directors who are all big about cinema has to be on the big screen and stuff even they're kind of throwing the white flag and saying, fine, we'll do a deal with a streamer. We'll have the movie out on limited release in theaters. So I get to have my vision on the big screen. Maybe do a festival run. But eventually it's going to be showing up on the streamer uh, for people to watch at home. Um, I would point out, again, everything, everywhere, all at once, I think it's one of the big standouts of the originals. But again, that movie still as much money as it made it's chump change compared to all the movies that you just mentioned um which is crazy to think about when you're talking about movies that are making over a hundred million dollars being like low on the on the box office scale it's kind of crazy to think about just how different the scales have become now that we're getting billion dollar movies here and there but i i just i really really think that the pandemic just kind of help accelerate this trend of that people are just more conditioned to watching stuff on streamers. They're going to be, they're going to be careful as to what they're going to spend their money at the theater for. Yeah. Luis Mendez joining us. This goes back to something we talk to you about just about every time you're on here, the, the movie makers, the creators and the streamers and the, you know, the, the partnership that those things go into because the studios have to talk to the distributors. That's always been the war behind the scenes in movies is the makers and the distributors fighting over what gets out and how it gets out. It seems like we're in a transitional phase where they haven't figured out the business model yet. They haven't figured out that, hey, this movie is really going to do well on streaming. This movie is going to do really well on the theater. Top Gun. They, they, they took, like, now you can say, well, it's one of the biggest movies of all time. That was an enormous risk to sit on that movie for two years with the amount of budget and the like you're talking millions and millions and millions. Of, that was a huge risk and it paid off. And then you have these other ones where they're like, well, let's take this big budget thing and put it on stream and it may hit or it may not. That's really the fight here, right? They haven't quite figured out the business model of if it's not a tent pole, it's really iffy going to a theater. And some stuff they haven't figured out, like, look, this would actually probably do really well in streaming if you just give it a chance on streaming. Oh, yeah. And, and sometimes I honestly find myself kind of scratching my head as to why didn't they come out with this on streaming, at least maybe do a same day release. I've been seeing Universal's been doing that with Peacock of late. Um, there, I mean, while I do think that there are certain movies that would be helped by theatrical exclusivity, uh, I think there are others that would be helped by the streaming but unfortunately you have some of these filmmakers who are um, really really want their movies on the big screen um 
at the same time, also, you do have these certain situations like the, the mess that's going on with Warner Brothers right now, where they are really like completely overhauling what their plans with HBO Max. They're dealing with a merger, a lot of controversies, but then canceling movies that they've actually shot. <laughs> they've canceled to forget tax write offs. They've just completely taken things off streaming without any physical media available for that stuff. Uh, so it, 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 I agree on the business model that they haven't figured out, but also I think there's a, also kind of this pull as to how much say does the creative, do the creative folks have, the filmmakers and such compared to the business model. Yeah, Luis Mendez joining us. And that's the problem because with the technology change and the media change, that doesn't happen in a vacuum anymore. The distributors used to be the gatekeepers. Well, now if you tick off the wrong creator, the wrong creator is going to go on on Twitter or Facebook or, you know, make a TikTok and they're going to flame you. And nobody knows who, you, you know, you, the distributor are in this famous director or this famous star or whatever the case may be. The people's going to side with them and now you got a mess on your hands. That's another part of this reality that I don't think they fully dealt with. And we've seen it. We've had whole movies that are probably pretty good movies that go down because of public backlash. This they haven't mastered the social media part of this either, have they? No, I don't I don't think so either. And and so and it also doesn't help. And this is not just a movie thing, because I've seen this even in freaking professional wrestling, where I think now that people have social media at their fingertips, sometimes they get really frustrated if maybe something's not making the money that they thought it was going to be or, they, or there's some business deal that's going bad. So they go to social media to vent their frustration. Of course, there's a lot different than you venting your frustration on Twitter, say uh, the ice cream machines aren't all on at McDonald's uh, like you like to tweet about. <laughs> and now if you but compared to that and someone talking about these million dollar deals that they're making with movies and such and their complaints about that um and and when in reality maybe things are a little nuanced i know there's a lot of controversy right now regarding uh the writer and and co-star of the movie bros he's he's getting really frustrated and um saying things that i think i think it's honestly a much more nuanced situation than he is but at the same time i get being frustrated and, and venting your frustration out um, and I, I just don't think, I mean, look, Warner Brothers has been having a horrible social media uh, re situation regarding all the controversies going on on HBO Max. Um, and on top of that, this Ezra Miller situation that's happening with The Flash. So I'm not sure that they have gotten the social media part of it just right, especially because honestly, and if, if you're really involved in film Twitter, the people, who, the, the studios don't have much say on the the conversations and the narratives that break out sometimes. Yeah. And let's just deal with the bro thing for a second. Bro's the movie, by the way, for folks that aren't paying attention. Uh, Billy Eichner went out and I don't know anything about Billy Eichner other than what I've read about him. I, I didn't see his, his stuff when he was doing the online game show stuff and all that. I don't know nothing about him other than what I've read. I've read some not good stuff. I've read a few good things. You know, he obviously has some talent, He's just flaming people for not going out and seeing his movie online. And he's taking the angle on it because it is a romantic comedy about two gay men. So he's taking that angle on it. The thing is, there's probably something to that. But you can see the chart. Somebody on Twitter did it, and I can't credit them, so I don't want to use it. But they did a chart. They're like, look, rom-coms at the theater have been doing terrible for years. It's a declining medium on top of it. Plus, you're releasing a rom-com in the middle of October, plus, you know, all these other factors in it. This is another one of these where a lot of people online are like, I love this movie, but I wish it was on streaming. These things have a lot of layers to them. And when you have a star, right, and, and I understand it in this case, because this was obviously his passion project. He's starring in it. He wrote it. He's, you know, this is his baby. When, when you go online like that, 
there's a bunch of things that can happen and almost none of them are good for your project, for your movie or for your brand. Right. And, and to, to be fair, I don't think that he's 100% wrong because I mean, we know that there are people who don't go sure. to the movies simply because they believe that they're fighting a culture war and they're not and Hollywood is the enemy and stuff like that. I mean, not, not that Hollywood is pure or anything like that, but the point is, is that they, they don't go to the movies because of that kind of stuff and including movies that kind of push some pro social progressive stuff like this movie technically would. However, the, the problem, and I understand his frustration because the movie was very well received at the Toronto Film Festival. It's got great reviews. It's got great audience reactions. You've actually seen it, right? You like the movie. Yes, I, I gave the movie a, a B plus review. I saw it with my wife, and she she ended up loving it. Also, uh, it's a very funny movie. Uh, it is a raunchy comedy, but it is a funny movie. But I will tell you, I knew something was up when it was literally me, my wife another couple and some random dude and we went on a friday night that's that's when i knew there was maybe this wasn't going to be making the money they were hoping it was going to make i will point out that there was also a gay uh romance movie came out in 2018 love simon and that actually didn't do too bad at the box office but that was a completely different marketplace and i would i would say that the last time we had a rom-com that did big money was crazy rich asians 2018 completely different marketplace uh the lost city now technically the lost city did pretty good but i would argue that some people don't see that as a rom-com so much as an adventure movie and they really market it that way smartly we've got a big rom-com coming out in a couple weeks ticket to paradise starring george clooney and julia roberts i have a feeling that movie's not going to be doing so hot at the box office even with those big names attached because a lot of people have just gotten used to, and it doesn't help that Netflix is pumping them out almost every week, watching rom-coms or watching anything rom romance genre-wise on streaming. Because it's, it, you know, and the Hallmark Channel makes a lot of money off of that kind of stuff too. And I think what's happened is that that is part of it. Another part of it is that there's no big names attached. I never heard of Billy personally until the movie myself. Um, and on top of that, I, I didn't think the poster was particularly great. It's it's you're just seeing the back of two dudes, um, and I, I I just think that while I understand his frustrations, while I do think that maybe there is some homophobia involved in it, at the end of the day, you you got all these other market situations going on that was that was going to always hurt this movie. Yeah, Luis Mendez joining us. This is a bigger picture kind of question, but it flows into what you just asked, though. How, is there so much content now that you've just numbed and fractionalized and niched the audience to death? I think there's something to that line of thought of that. There's just so much content. And there's you just mentioned Netflix pumping it out. We're getting ready to get into movie season for Hallmark, which is a big thing in my house because, you know, it is. Um there's so much, there's no way you can watch every movie like people used to do. Like people could say, well, I watched every major release this year. That's gone. That's never happening again. I think there's just a numbing of the audience. I think we have fractionalized the audience. And I think we are trying to now these movies, if you they're trying to do niche stuff on a big scale and niche stuff on a big scale almost never works. I just think we don't understand the change that the streaming and the media and the technology. I think a lot of people are just numb to big releases. I think they're numb to the marketing. I think they just kind of make up their own mind now. And I don't think any amount of money and marketing is going to change some of the ingrained way the market is now. Yeah. I, I mean, I agree with you 100% on that. There's way too much content out there. I mean, I, it's funny because sometimes a lot of my family members will be like, oh, wow, so you just watch every movie. I'm saying it's not possible to watch every movie, even as obsessive as I am. It is not possible, uh, especially TV movies, streaming movies, major releases, art house movies, uh, foreign movies, especially at a time where people are finding more interest in checking out foreign films. Uh, there, there's just too much out there. Uh, if you check out the letterbox. Uh, archives, some movies that, that are coming out. <laughs> it's ridiculous how many are coming out, hundreds of thousands each year. Um, when you really take up the entire globe altogether, uh, and it's also why I personally 
am dumbfounded that people are still doing top 10. I, I say you got to do like a top 15 because there's too much stuff coming out. And you're going to, and, and, and to me, I got to do a top 15 other uh, than the top 10 if I'm going to talk about my favorites at the end of the year. Um, and, and by the way, this is something that's happening all across media. We've got so many options that it's allowing people to kind of pick and choose their stuff. This, whether I mean, I'm seeing this in professional wrestling. I'm seeing this in music. I'm seeing this in TV. People are, we've got so many options out that it's very rare for something to be something where everybody is watching it. You know, you, you've gotten these rare instances, Game of Thrones becoming this huge pop culture thing. Um, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, I'm trying to think right now of some, it's it's becoming really hard. I mean, because even the simple stuff, you're going to meet plenty of people who are like, well, I haven't watched that. I haven't caught on to that yet. Uh, I mean, I think that the fact that we have so much content, because there are so many choices. Are you an art house fan? There's plenty of art house studios now. Are you big into blockbusters? We're getting a lot of blockbusters from the studios these days. Uh, they're, you know, it's funny. We used to call these event films, but I mean, how much of it is in a, for getting like 10 of them each year now? Top Gun was an event. I'll tell you that one, but I don't know that we'll oh, see yeah. another one of those anytime soon. Luis Mendez, he's so good on this stuff. We didn't even get to the award season stuff. We'll talk about that next time we have you on, which won't be too long till we get you on though. Let folks know what you've got going on. You're great. So you're, you're becoming Netflix yourself, man. You're popping out movie reviews about every day. It seems like. Uh, let folks know where they can follow you, where they can keep up with your stuff on social media and your sub stack and everything else. Well, basically, if you want to catch all the stuff that I do uh, and the main hub, that is MendezMovieReport.Substack.com. If you want to find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or if you happen to have a box, Mendes Movie RPT. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out something to do with my YouTube. I'm still sitting there, but I'll figure something out. I am very excited about the fact that I recently was accepted to critics groups. So I am going to be sort of a little part of award season this year. So that's going to be interesting. I, you get need YouTube content, call me and I'll explain to you. I will give my well-honed defense of the um, Miami Vice movie and why everybody misunderstood that great piece of American cinema because it was fantastic, among other hot takes that everybody hates me for. So give me a call, buddy. Nobody else will come on there with you. I got your back. Oh, hey, that's fine, especially when it comes to Star Wars. Oh, yeah, I just we just talked to our buddy Michael Siegel about Star Wars. So we I got to get you two together. We'll just do a big Star Wars roundtable one of these days, buddy. Uh, Luis Mendez, do great work, sir. Thank you for the time today. Hey, no problem. Thanks for having me. Thank you, sir. about virtue signaling if you know who you are it makes it a lot easier to get your points across because people want real like you know you're a columnist you're a public figure you've done you know congressional staffing so you've done like statistical analysis people want real and what something that's happening online is folks are figuring out really quick who's real and who's not but that's a two-edged sword because with this virtue signaling stuff is you can also reveal that you're not real in a really big hurry when you don't actually mean to I don't know that that's really a fixable thing because that's an individual thing. That's a First Amendment thing. Where that changes, and this is where you get into it in your piece, is that's you and me and Joe Schmo and and you know Buddy Up Cabin Creek and whoever talking about it, and you know the the crazy pothead and Parker can say whatever they want to say out in Colorado, right? When the government starts doing it, though, and a government official or an elected official or an unelected bureaucrat, for that matter and they start putting the power and force of government behind something like that, though, it changes into a very different thing, though, doesn't it? It certainly does. And I highlighted a couple of things in that piece where uh, we at first was a, and I, I say this, I'm basically a right-leaning uh, columnist at a very, at a left-leaning paper. Um, I'm kind of like the Ross Dutot and the, the George Will only out here in the middle of flyover country. And I, I tend to poke 
poke fun at both sides because I think, you know, any at any given point, someone is doing something stupid somewhere. And sometimes they're Republicans, sometimes they're Democrats, sometimes they're independent. A lot of the, you know, <laughs> Green Party, Libertarian, whatever. And so I picked out a couple of different examples of lawmakers here in the vicinity, both on the left and the right, who did things that will not hold up in court. I believe they did them to virtue signal, to show to their base, hey, I'm with you. And the first one was a conservative county commissioner decided that he was going to go after a Pride Fest event that is held on a on the, the fairgrounds of a basically a conservative leaning county. Now, I'm not into Pride Fest. I don't go to them. I don't care. But because there was a wardrobe malfunction and a fake boob on a male performing as a female was shown, this lawmaker is using that as pretext to make sure that Pride Fest can't come back to the, the fairgrounds. And the same, uh, the same commissioner, he threatened to buy a big uh, park from an, an adjacent jurisdiction because that adjacent dur- jurisdiction had put in place a concealed carry ban um, in parks. So, but, but, the, but the district can't even afford the property. So again, it's kind of threatening something that can't happen. And then we got a big left-leaning district out in Boulder that has decided there's no gun shows at county fairs. And that's not going to hold up in court because you can't allow other kinds of buying and selling opportunities and not allow lawful gun sales on the same fairground. So I, I draw the line here because these are all sort of virtue signaling. They're telling their base, look, we're anti-guns or we're anti-Pride Fest. Or I'm thinking, how about you just get a bumper sticker? and then spare us and spare your staff the time it's gonna to take to put this in and then to also try to hold it up in court because it's not gonna hold up. So you're you're wasting taxpayer money. And it's not just wasting taxpayer money. This is something I've tried really hard to do since I started doing public writing and then later that led to media. A lot of what we talk about is virtue signaling or even you know ideological things, You know the real hot button culture war stuff is to kind of turn the noise down on it and get into it and it's like, okay, is this really a problem or is this a vehicle somebody's using for power? Mm-hmm. And more often than not, if it's something really loud, like that gun show, like the pride events, like, you know, drag queen story hour on some state, you know, 2000 miles away, somebody going after a church during COVID, you can pick both sides are very bad at this. Whatever you're going to pick, almost without exception, if you dig and dig and dig enough, you end up coming to somebody who's basic, you know, when you really get down to it, they're just saying, I don't like this and I want the power to make it stop. That's not virtue signaling. That's abuse of power. Unless it's something criminal, in which case there's already a criminal code or morally wrong, in which case you have some civil options to go to court and try to stop it and argue your case. It's always when you strip it down and you get rid of the buzzwords and you get rid of all the nonsense and you get rid of people's feels to use the the vernacular of the kids these days. It's really mostly going to be about somebody wanting power to make somebody else do something they don't really want to do, but they think they should be doing right. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Virtue signaling becomes power, uh, abuse of power when lawmakers decide that they can voice their will on the rest of us. My thought is this. If you don't want to go to uh, Pride Fest, don't go. Um, people, all the people who witnessed that that uh, wardrobe malfunction were people who meant to be there. And yeah, they did bring their family with them. That is their choice. They have a choice to be able to go and they made that choice. I wouldn't make the same choice. And if you don't want to make that choice, don't make it. Same goes for gun shows. If you don't want to own a gun, if you don't want to go to a gun show, don't go. Uh, but don't begrudge a law-abiding person the opportunity to to buy a firearm. And here's the funny thing is that when you look at statistics, the people who commit crimes generally don't buy their firearms from gun shows. Uh, this is Gun shows are where law-abiding people go to buy firearms. And same, same goes with the concealed carry ban in, in Denver area parks. People who own, who have a concealed carry permit are the least likely to commit crimes if you compare them to other people. So there, there is, a you know, Virtue signaling, everyone does it, but when you're doing it and enhancing your own power and really discriminating against other people, in, in you know, Douglas County is saying that, hey, if you want to have a festival of some kind, you can come to the, the counter, the county fairgrounds, unless you're gay and you're about gay pride, then you can't come. 
Um, Boulder County is saying, yeah, you can come here and have some kind of a big swap meet. You can sell, um, you know, rocks and gems, whatever you want to do. But if it's firearms, you can't sell it. And you, you just can't do those things. You cannot have viewpoint discrimination. You cannot use the power of government to force your viewpoint on other people. Chris K for Denver Post columnist joining us. The other side of that is because you've been on the other side of it. You've worked, you know, on the political side of it as a staffer and other things. When you have competing, let's call them stunts, because like we said, if, if you if you do something and you know it's not going to hold up in court, but it's going to be a year and a half or two years from now before it gets through court and it'll be after an election, looking at certain people right now, you know, that <laughs> that's a stunt. But then you have competing stunts because there's going to be a reaction from whatever person you stunted or the side you stunted. They're going to react to that with another stunt. But on a practical level, especially on the local and state level, that makes doing coherent, consistent policy that we need to have normal everyday lives to have economic freedom, to have political consistency for people to have an environment of freedom. It makes that almost impossible, doesn't it? Because now the lawmakers are going to spend all their time stunting instead of trying to figure out ways to work together and make the, I know if Polly is to say, well, they've got to work together. Well, if they're fighting, they're not, you know, it's the old mob thing. If you're on the mattresses, you ain't making money. If you're fighting each other, you ain't legislating stuff. And there's no way to have consistent policy, good, bad, or indifferent, if that's all you're doing. And I see that part accelerating and I see the legislative part falling by the wayside. I think you're right. So I, I was a congressional staffer in the late nineties. And then I worked for a big think tank in DC in the early 2000s. And what's interesting, I'm not saying there was no no political theater. I mean, political theater is, is age old, but politicians making big speeches, saying insulting things, provoking people, uh, you know, doing different things. It, it, that's just sort of stock and trade of, of political power. But there's definitely less of it. And what's interesting is that there's something, there's 13, 13 uh, spending bills. We managed, I mean, I, I say we, I was a staffer for a congressman, and we managed to pass all of them. The, all, you know, we never did omnibus bills. We actually managed to pass all of those those bills. And people did work together a lot more. Yeah, there was you know there was tension, there was friction, and people disagreed. But I would say the proportion of theater to actually working on things, the working on things was more than the theater. It feels like, and I'd have to quantify it if I were to, you know, call up a congressman's office or a congresswoman's office and say. How many of your staff members are actually working on real legislation versus uh, being provocative and getting yourself on Fox News? I don't know what that ratio is exactly, but the way it feels to me is that it's more theater, less action. I mean, you know, I remember the 90s. I'm old enough. 98 was my first election, the midterms. That's the Clinton impeachment election. So, yeah, mm -hmm. there there was some mess going on. Trust me. Yeah. Uh, I remember that time period well. But. It's in the, it's you mentioned it though. What changed in the '90s was the rise of network news as we now know it. We started getting the internet. We started having you know alternate media. Um, things like Rush Limbaugh was at his peak in the late '90s, early 2000s. The internet started changing it. Then it changed again in the mid 2000s with smartphones. It's changing it again now because you have even more technology. Virtue signaling is one of those things that seems to fit the new media environment really, really well, because you can go to that way faster and it fits into, you know, the, the characters on Twitter and you can get it on a TikTok real fast. It almost feels like something like virtue signaling, which is already an ingrained part of human nature. You can call it other things throughout human history, but it's always been there. This media environment, it's almost like it's tailor made for it. So <laughs> observer of humanity that you are, what do you think is a more productive way for people to talk about it? Because calling out hypocrisy never works. If you take, you know, any kind of debate class ever, they'll just be like, you know, never address hypocrisy because you just end up in a circle. So calling out hypocrisy on virtue signaling is never going to work and we're all doing it. So that's not going to work either. What's a more productive way to have this conversation, do you think? You know, it's hard to virtue signal face to face. 
Um, you know, it's something you put on your, your Twitter account, you put it on your car. But when you actually sit down and talk to people, people don't talk in slogans. They don't sort of um, push those things on each other. So I guess I would recommend more face-to-face -face conversations and also just having the discipline to say, I'm not going to follow people who are provocative. I'm not going to respond to people who are provocative. I have basically a no response uh, rule for myself that if somebody is nasty to me, I just mute them. I'm just done. Um, because what they want to do is they want to provoke me and I'm supposed to provoke them. And then they're supposed to provoke me again. And it's sort of like a tit for tat, you know, provoking and virtue signaling. I don't want to do any of that. It's a total waste of time. I'd rather waste my time on Wordle, frankly. <laughs> you know what I mean? If I'm going to waste my time, it should be on dog videos. It should not be on uh, trading tit for tat for some angry person. So for the most part, unless some, if somebody comes at me with a criticism of my column or something I've tweeted that is reasonable, of course I'll interact with them. But if they're going to be nasty, then I, it's just automatic mute. And I, I think having both the discipline to be disciplined in our social media interactions, and then also just making the time to spend time with people. I, I have a lot of friends on the left, which surprises some folks because I've been uh, you know, a person of the sort of center right for a long time. And we don't talk about politics most of the time. We talk about food and travel and you know stuff that we like, animals. Basically, if you like dogs, I probably like you. Um, I have, you know, very rarely we'll meet somebody who likes dogs or horses that is not a likable person. But generally speaking, if you like animals, um, I'm there. I love food. I'll feed anyone. I'll eat anyone's food for the most part. I I love travel. I love to meet people from other countries. It's it's that kind of face to face interaction that that takes us away from virtue signaling and maybe just being virtuous. Yeah, and my rule is, but I started doing was. Um, anything unless it's somebody i really know well i'll go along with them you know the third tweet is like a bar after midnight nothing good's going to happen after that third tweet usually <laughs>things like that but one thing i've learned and i try to do on twitter and i try to keep a pretty positive timeline most of the time every now and then i'll i'll get wound up about something one of the most precious things you have is your time you you don't owe people that are bad faith actors your time and if you just kind of get that through your head on and facebook's even worse than this but i don't have facebook because i you know i like my family and i want to keep loving them so i don't have facebook because those two things <laughs> wouldn't go together but i do have twitter and one of the things about Twitter is, is I just learned, I was like, okay, I'm, there's certain things where I feel like I owe it to people to respond. Like, you know, if I write something that I know is hot or, you know, if I, if I'm on, you know, if I go on like Young Turks where I know I'm going to be getting mess because it's just built into the cake, um, things like that, you know, you, and everything's in my real name. So that keeps me accountable. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's that part of it, but no, you, nobody has a right to just make me get angry over their little thing that doesn't affect me one little bit. And I really God, wonder. Really yeah. And I just, I'm like, you know, I got four daughters and four dogs and I just, I ain't got time for this mess. But the other part of it is, and, and the long winded way to get to it is it doesn't gain me a blessed thing to get upset on the internet. Mm -hmm. It really doesn't. That's really the virtue signal is that you can get angry online and get seal claps from your in group and it's easy. And that's just as much a virtue signal as the bumper sticker or the flag or the t-shirt or the hat or whatever the other case is. That's where this stuff gets dangerous is when you start put, you know, not to be a pop psychologist here, but when you're, when you're purposely getting the negative reinforcement out of your virtue signaling, I think that's way more dangerous than just wearing the t-shirt of your candidate of choice or your cause of choice or a rainbow flag or a red Trump hat or whatever the case may be. Cause those aren't inherently negative. Although I know they can be sometimes that, that need for that negative online is the one that I just say, Nope, I'm not interacting with this anymore. It's, it's, it, there's no, there's no good in it at all. 
I, I have to watch myself from getting the sort of the dopamine hit on likes. Like, you know, if I post a picture of some wildlife photography, I, you know, I find myself checking to see if anyone's liked it, right? Or if I make a clever statement or post a column and I'm looking for likes. And I, I just have to monitor myself to make sure that I'm not using that as my so its main source of dopamine. It needs to be the people around me, it needs to be meaningful, significant activity online. And yeah, I mean, I would say that for the most part, it if social media, if you're disciplined about it, it can be a positive. I've connected with people. I sometimes sell things on Facebook Marketplace. And uh, you know, if somebody inherits a bunch of stuff, I don't want it, I'll I'll sell it for them for a commission. And I have met the nicest people that have come to my house. I've ended up like sending them home with plants because I'm a big gardener and I'll be like, take these plants, take them away. And so I find that it's been, social media has facilitated both Facebook and Twitter. I've met some really interesting people that I correspond with, but I just use the self-discipline. If somebody is nasty or inauthentic, I, I don't know who they are, if they actually are a real person, why should I interact with them? I like you. Everything is under my own name. So my public Facebook page, my Twitter page, my uh, my Substack, my column, everything is under my name. I never send out any message that is not attached to my name. So if it would dishonor my name, it's not going out. Yeah, it's something I do too, because my kids are all old enough. They don't even have to have a Twitter account. They can just Google my name and my Twitter feeds first thing pops up. So keeps us all fair. Uh, Krista Kafer always, uh, love talking about this stuff because this stuff's important because you can talk about the politics and the policy stuff, but if you're not, you know, doing good stuff on your own line, none of that stuff matters because nobody's going to listen to you. Um, the dopamine hit of talking to good people though, cause I've, I've made some really important to me relationships just through the Twitter now over the last four years. And, um, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Krista Kafer, thank you so much for the time today. All the music on Hertel is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com.